Number one, Ibble Dibble here. Hello, friends. Welcome back for part two of Rank at Invictus. <laughs> <laughs> wherein we rank Megan's all-time Invictus looks over the past five years from best to worst. Look number 10, what I call Megan's depressed American in Paris outfit. This one was honestly hard for me to look at because I definitely worn a version of this myself many times. Is it flattering? No, it is not. <laughs> no one wearing this outfit thinks they look good. It's definitely a walking the dog on the weekend, feeling slightly embarrassed, picking up a bag of Viennoise Hui look. It says, I can afford Celine and Cartier, but I need to work and also possibly drink my ass off to do so. And it's killing me. The thing is, we know Megan is not an exhausted, cynical person. So why would she choose this look? After all, she's wearing this for the sole purpose of getting photographed. She had no actual obligation to be present at this event or any other Invictus event. The conclusion I've come to is that her ideas about fashion, like her ideas about sexism, racism, and classism, stopped evolving when she graduated high school in 1999. In the decade prior, there were two super stylists in New York that I think Megan is still trying to reference and imitate, and she just keeps coming up short. I'm talking, of course, about, and I apologize, I can't say her name for shit, Catherine Swift Dudel. Cici di Carlin Serde Dudel. Et moi! And Connie Goodman. This is one of my favorite pictures that you did. It was called Hit the Ground Running. Yeah. Even if you don't know their names, if you are American, at least, I guarantee you know their style. First, CCD, the original appropriator of bling, the progenitor of maximalist high-low style. These are what she herself ranked as her most iconic shoots. Let me know in the comments below if you didn't know the name, but you definitely know the work. I see so many Carleen signatures in Megan's style. Number one, jeans with everything. The more classic the jacket, the more degraded the denim. Number two, piles of jewelry, usually gold, though sometimes silver, with particular emphasis on bangles, watches, and medallion necklaces. Oh, and how could I forget? Rings on every finger. Number three, pushed up sleeves, probably just to avoid snagging all that jewelry. Number four, logomania and logo layers. How many vintage Hermes scarf pillows would you add to a sofa to give it a little je ne sais quoi? Number five, monogram everything. Number six, aviators. She still wears other styles sometimes, but it's aviators pretty much daily. Number seven, trench coats. And can we talk about these cat toe Chanel's? She's been in the game since 1977. She grew up in Paris high society, more specifically at Place du Palais Bourbon, next door to the Vogue studios. Summering in Saint-Tropez, her father was a businessman and diplomat, and her mother a fabulous countess, descended from an ancient Belgian noble family, once the title, and on the other side, the princely family of Montenegro. Perhaps because she never wanted for anything. She always had money, she always had status, she always had stuff, she always had a loving family that she talks about all the time. She can be fun, tacky, over-the-top, bold, because she's never been concerned with impressing anyone she's never needed or wanted to seem like something she's not. Thrown together from basics you've owned for years because you packed incorrectly and are dying of PMS, this outfit is what it is. <laughs> this is Charlotte Hazaragi, by the way, thinking, fuck, I've been popped, <laughs> as opposed to Megan pretending to think that. <laughs> purchased fresh from the boutiques for $46,000 with the intent to be worn at a very public event and seen by tens or hundreds of thousands of people. This is a gutless, toothless, colorless, pale imitation of CCD. A big reason outfits like this bother me so much anyway is that they usually reflect a struggle with class pretensions rather than an engagement with aesthetics. And I think that's one of the toughest things for people to step back and be honest with themselves about when it comes to quote unquote style. I think that internal struggle makes it hard for a lot of people 
people to get dressed in the morning. I think it's one of the reasons they say women feel worse after reading a fashion magazine, not better. And it's one of those things that's so evident in Megan's looks that even her best clothes betray her. Anyway, the point of this very long tangent is certainly not to scoff at Megan and tell her she'll never be a Heather. It's to point out that even her good and average outfits feel a bit off because we know narcissists are always wearing a mask. I guess they're always wearing a costume too. This outfit ranks so high out of 26 because I actually think it is appropriate, though ostentatious, for sitting in bleachers and drinking beer and watching sports. Public figures actually don't don't need to be stylish, in my opinion, just appropriate for whatever occasion they're at. I don't know. What do you think? Okay, look 11. Megan visits the pub. I like the shirt. I don't know why she thinks those jeans fit her. <laughs> they're obviously too tight. You don't break in stretch jeans. If you wear stretch jeans that are already too small for you 10 days in a row, you just get these weird horizontal wrinkles like she has. The shoes and bag go together, but neither goes with this shirt. To me, they so obviously clash. It's an innate reaction. So it's hard for me to understand how she doesn't see it. I said it in my Ozempic pop walk video. She needs a pair of navy ballet flats. Also, cuckoo, megalomania. Manolo does custom. You're a duchess. Just walk into literally any Manolo boutique and ask them to match anything you want in any style you like. She already owns stuff that would have looked better with these clothes. It's so weird to me how she just doesn't see it. Also, if you were wondering from my last video, this is the infamous sold out, had to close the pre-order early, Quiana bag that Megan made a bestseller, supposedly. Take a look at this bag. Is this an iconic bestseller? What do you think? I was also quite surprised to see the lady in the picture next to her is also in white jeans and actually sort of tropical shirt, pink and orange. Is this normal for mid-September in Germany? Isn't that sweater weather? Let me know. Okay, look 12. <laughs> <laughs> her first rodeo with clown pants. I think this is like a lot of stuff she wears. I'm sure there's a supermodel or two this outfit would look great on, but Megan personally does not have the height or curves to work it. Also, the hems, the hems, the hems, the hems. There's a bone on the top of your foot. If you can't see it, you can feel it with your fingers. A thumb's width below that bone is where your trousers should break. Whether you're wearing heels, whether you're wearing flats, Megan has caused me to think quite a lot about whether trousers shown sort of dragging on the runway are acceptably worn in the same manner in real life. The Valentino suit is a great example. It is too long, but not absurdly so. I could rationalize that one. These are starting to annoy me. And the designer, Brandon Maxwell, is guilty of showing his trousers like this season after season. Look at this picture of Jordan Dunn. What the fluff has he done to those hems? This is terrible. And this wasn't some second-rate event she snagged an outfit from the sample room for at the last minute. This was the 2016 British Fashion Awards. And here's an even stranger thing. 2016 is when Maxwell was still working primarily as a celebrity stylist before he popped off as a designer. If you were a professional stylist, would you send out a supermodel to the British Fashion Awards <laughs> with these? hems. And I'm not even mentioning that top. I just can't today. My initial reaction is to blame Megan and her team who should know better just because they're adults. But I could understand if they're getting confused. If you'd like to furrow brows wherever you go, this look will only run you $45,864. Look 13, yet another terrible shirt dress. I actually think her folded up sleeves and popped collar do help this dress. It's just so such a premiocre dress. Self-belted color block denim for $1,590? It looks like a home dressmaker ran out of one shade of denim, so she used two. 
and it is $1,600. It looks like something Isaac Mizrahi was bullied into putting his name on at Target, and that's why he left, and it is $1,600. It looks like a Draper James collaboration at Kohl's, and it is $1,600. And by the way, I'm not even knocking shopping at Target or Kohl's. A budget is a budget. I'm just pointing out, Megan has even less sense than she does taste. She's also done that annoying thing where she's worn blue clothing with black heels. This isn't terrible. It's just giving office worker on a budget. I would have loved to see something with a little personality. What about some neon patent Louboutins? What about some candy colored suede Manolos? Really turn the Susie homemaker look into a tongue in cheek fashion statement rather than attempting it in earnest. I've noticed that when Megan is wearing a simple outfit, she needs to compensate for it with the bling bling. <laughs> so if you go to the store to buy this unassuming ensemble, it will run you $102,320. Okay, look 14. This one is another example of frankly too small for her Valentino. I don't know what size she thinks she is. She's two sizes bigger than this. An A-line dress should never pull anywhere, even when you walk. Like this shirt dress, the A-line shift is such a simple design that I also can't fathom why she would spend $6,000 on one from Valentino. I love Valentino, love an A-line shift, appreciate the skill it takes to do a good laser cutout. I understand she has all the money in the world and she can spend whatever she wants. The value isn't there on this one, in my opinion. I'll give her a little credit for keeping the skirt a decent length here, which is something she appears to have abandoned in recent years, but I also have to subtract those same points. Wearing a chocolate brown suede bag and shoe with an all white spring summer dress. I think California girls are less strict with seasonal rules, but a brown suede bag and shoe is fall winter. I kind of think she was trying to interpret this Diana look without realizing number one, Diana also made a bunch of fashion mistakes. <laughs> that shoe and that bag do not go together. Although her dress actually fits, so good job, Diana. And number two, this Gucci color. They call brown, but it's actually not brown. It's more like a putty or a gray brown clay. So even though I still don't like it with a white shift dress, it does coordinate a bit better. All right, look 15. This is where I really start to actively dislike her outfits. Before I found fault here or there, I saw things I would change, things I would switch up. Now we're getting into the just no, no go. <laughs> <laughs> Not worth improving. Crumple it up, throw it away. This looks like she showed up at a country club for dinner and was forced to wear this jacket because her jeans didn't conform to the dress code. The oversized jacket over the tight all black look combined with that rictus grin and intense stare also makes me feel like I'm at a trade show and she's about to aggressively offer me a sample. <laughs> she appears to have retired this jacket and bag, thankfully. Look 16. This is really the same outfit as look 15, just a different year. She's wearing a cashmere shell instead of a turtleneck bodysuit, Manolo's instead of Aquazuras, and it looks like she got her jeans hemmed way above her ankles because she really loves to show off those ankles. The Chloe dinner jacket has the same shapeless, oversized, mismatch vibe. What was she even going for with this? Why did she bother? Where did she miss? I think now is a good time to discuss the second New York Uber stylist. I think Megan imitates Tani Goodman. Tani's look is a total 180 from Kathleen. Very American sportswear very minimalist. She puts emphasis on practicality, color blocking, geometry. We can also see some of Tawny's signatures in Megan's style. Number one, a neutral palette. She wears black, white, beige, navy, I think that's it. Number two, white jeans, whatever this season. She wears white jeans almost every day. Number three, always a jacket, a poncho, a pullover if you must, but never a cardigan. Number four, big menswear trousers. Not on her, mind you, but she's the one who gets assigned the office wear spreads every single time. Tawny also came from a very loving family that she talks about frequently, also a high society family. But this time in New York, her father was a prominent surgeon, a man she calls self-made. 
Her mother was a painter, a textile designer. Tawny grew up on the Upper East Side with a summer house in Sands Point. Her sister, Wendy Goodman, was a prominent fashion editor already by the early 80s and is still a prominent interiors editor. Tawny was a beautiful model when she was young, and her first job was for Diana Vreeland at the Met. She worked alongside Andre Leon Talley. Side note, I still haven't discussed the Andre Leon Talley erasure in Edward Enenfull's whole first black fashion editor in the world shtick in my Megan in Vogue series. I promise I'll get to it. She experienced success rather early, styling Calvin Klein's iconic 80s ad campaigns. Like Carlene, she never felt less than, as Megan would say, but clearly has a very different energy and personality and material expression of that ease. Her unshakable innate self-confidence impacted her style by letting her indulge in not showing off at all. She never wears jewelry, never wears logos, almost never wears heels. She just places no value whatever on flash. She is the living definition of effortless style. There's some overlap between Kathleen and Tawny. First of all, they're 70-year-old professionals. Tani can do layers of accessories on layers of prints. Kathleen can do BCBG. They both love a big old watch. Head to toe black, strappy sandals, trench coats, men's shirts. For Tawny, androgynous basics are a subtle way of pulling attention to a long, lean body that doesn't pull attention in the more classic feminine ways. For Kathleen, the same basics are a foil to the most extreme elements of girliness. Lots of jewelry, lots of fun logos, lots of scarves and handbags at once, just a lot. I think over the years, Megan has maybe consciously, maybe subconsciously parsed and purchased the items that contribute to the signature style that dominated American fashion magazines in the 90s and 2000s, which if you can't tell from the number of covers and campaigns I've shown, was 85% Carleen and Tawny. I really cannot express to you how dominant these two were and still kind of are. That said, she never understood or perhaps never cared to understand that throwing together all the symbols isn't enough to make a good look. You can't just transpose Kathleen's stacks of gold and logo layered accessories onto Tawny's workwear neutrals and expect that to come together. Logomania works in hashtag surf style because CCD is not trying to be subtle about it. Head to toe black works on Tawny because it's not skin tight. Oversized menswear style jackets work on Tawny because she doesn't pair them with five inch heels. So let's really break this one down because for such a simple outfit, I found it so annoying. Can we talk about these sneakers. There are so many great looking, reasonably priced sneakers in the world with more integrity, design integrity than Hermes sneakers. What about gazelles, suede's, low top chucks, Mexico 66's, Air Force 1's? <laughs> that last one was a joke. We know she would never. What about gats? When in Dusseldorf, do as the Dusseldorfers do. Wearing literally anything the people in the stands can afford could also be a nice change. Sneakers are a great opportunity to do that. I believe Catherine wears Supergas. My theory on all the brand spanking new Hermes accessories she's been wearing lately is that she's afraid to ask them for a Birkin. Being the very online weirdo we know she is, I'm sure she's read all those stories about how you have to befriend a sales associate. You have to buy $10,000 of shawls and shoes and passport covers and teacups and tell that sales associate slash texty bestie one fine day that your heart's desire is a 30 centimeter Birkin in gold tone with palladium hardware like every other BB. In reality, all she has to do is go on vacation in Paris and send Harry into one of the shops. All he has to say is that he really wants to surprise her with something nice and he knows these bags are the best and they'll give him one. They might try to soak her, <laughs> but they'll give him one. My final conspiracy theory about this outfit, which is so much plainer than the rest of her outfits, 
especially over the past couple of years, is this. When she first attended Invictus in 2017, before they were engaged, publicly anyway, she wore a black t-shirt and black jeans and either no or very minimal jewelry and made out with Harry in front of her mom, which was super weird. Obviously, this was back when she was playing the most important role of her career. No, I'm not talking about suits. I'm talking about pretending to be low maintenance and pretending she was terribly impressed and seduced by Harry. And I think something must have happened that day or that night, maybe, when she knew he had fallen for her. He did something when she was wearing those clothes to let her know he was totally whipped. And that's why I think my conspiracy, allegedly, she's worn this random, simple, kind of cheap black look to two out of three Invictus games since. She's trying to subconsciously remind him. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It's far less weird than cosplaying his dead mom. I just wish she'd wear an Invictus polo instead. I think that's just another really obvious fix. Or again, like I pointed out with her black shirt dress, throw a neon yellow belt on this give us Invictus colors at least look 17 this one befuddles me how did she put on this jacket and think I look great it obviously made her look even shorter waisted than she is I noticed that she has the little self belt on the second hole indicating she believes that cinching tighter makes her waist look smaller when it actually has the opposite effect especially because this jacket is a little bit too tight around her hips so it rides up slightly and then puffs out under that tightly cinched self belt. If she had the belt on the looser hole, the jacket would hang a bit better, create a longer line, and perhaps beholders would imagine a better waist than she actually has. This is really just perfectly unflattering. She also seems to not perceive that stand up and popped collars make her neck look very short. This can be countered in those ugly shirt dresses by unbuttoning pretty far down, but then of course you encounter the problem of revealing too much cleavage. This jacket is by Brandon Maxwell, who was also the designer of the original beige clown pants and the black coat dress she wore to get photographed at a military cemetery in LA on UK Remembrance Day. <laughs> One of her earlier dangerously transparent PR missteps. From Megan's choices, you'd think Brandon Maxwell was a terrible designer. He's not all bad. He has younger stuff, stuff that would flatter her much more. For example, instead of that ugly Carolina Herrera shirt dress, she could have worn this Brandon Maxwell double denim outfit and really given them Americana, <laughs> Canadian tuxedo, and perhaps more importantly, the impression that she knew the first thing about fashion. She also would have looked 10 years younger. Last look for today. Megan's very first appearance at Invictus before she and Harry officially debuted as a couple. She sat 10 seats down and several rows up from him with Marcus from Soho House. I personally <laughs> live, laugh, love that she's wearing three clashing shades of wine red. Monochrome definitely springs to mind when someone says royal style or British style. The difference, of course, being the British milliners and shoemakers who work for the aristocracy and royals dye everything to match meticulously, whereas Megan is showing her JV spirit. I also think if things hadn't panned out with Harry, Ms. Tig would have penned a melodramatic blog post about it featuring all of their Instagram photos. She's also playing the cheap date here with very minimal jewelry, an Aritzia dress, no-name bag, and I was surprised at how many tabloids ran stories about this look at the time, because now I can easily identify it as a big PR push. But back then, I didn't even know she existed. So it just goes to show she really was not famous before Harry gave her a celebrity identity. I'm actually sad I didn't know about her because <laughs> this was one of the first times the world got to see her full portfolio of crazy faces. <laughs> Hamming it up for the cameras. I think the back grid and splash photographers 
she hired must have known years before the rest of us that her marrying into the royal family would be far more compelling entertainment than Fergie or Princess Michael could ever give us. I am so happy and grateful now that money comes to me in increasing quantities through multiple sources on a continuous basis. I am so happy and grateful now that money comes to me in increasing quantities through multiple sources on a continuous basis. When I feel poor, I sniff my hair. My hair costs $3,000. There are fusion extensions, but I tell everyone it's a keratin treatment because I'm au naturel. They still smell a little bit like Le Labo Santal 33, which I wear every morning because I'm unique, classy, and special. I'm not a blank identity, a question mark, an absolute incomplete, ready to be whatever this dumb redhead wants to get what I want. I mean, I am that, but I'm also worthy and layered and nuanced and I'm enough exactly as I am. My hair also has layers, wavy layers like Julia Roberts, but also layered scents like the Soho House Leather and Oud Home Spray. Marcus poured all over me after we did it in the car. Sorry, Jamie, I have to look at you this way so people think I didn't hire you and you're a real paparazzo. Oh my God, maimed soldiers are a barrel of laughs. How long do I have to hold this grin before they finally show me on the big screen? I am open and receptive to all the wealth life offers me. I claim my abundance now. I claim my abundance now. Large sums of money come to me quickly and easily. Large sums of money come to me quickly and easily. I desire the highest and best in life, and now I draw the highest and best to me. I wonder what happened to that one. He looks kind of gross. Oh my god, are you taking a picture of me? Stop, but don't. Let me fix my hair. Royals just clap with one hand when they're holding a clutch bag and wearing a cape coat, right? I know how to be reborn and start all over and start all over. I don't start all over with the same old, same old. I just start all over. Even though I might be old, I'm still brand new every day because I do one day at a time. Marcus, is there any Coke in the car? Okay, that's it for today. I will be back shortly with part three. Let me know the best, and by best I mean worst, look in the comments below. Toodles. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Um.